Hello and welcome to another episode of IRC Book Club. Today we have our very first and very special guest on the show. We have Keith Rosen, oh. who uh, is going to talk about his book on uh, sales leadership today, aren't you, Keith? That I am. That I am, Johnny. Yeah. So we've been talking about it now over the last four weeks and we put a bit of an appeal out to the audience to ask for people to come back to us, give us some questions. Michael and I have a few of our own. We have had a few come in um, and what we've got is a list of them. I think probably the best thing to do before we get going today, Keith, is to probably start a little bit with um, perhaps you could just give us a quick two minute elevator pitch on the book, why you wrote it what it's all about, and then we'll get into some of the q and I'll start with a question. Every manager comes to me with, Keith, how do, how do I develop a trusting team? How do I develop a team that's fully transparent? How do I ensure that all of my people know my intentions are always pure and in their best interest? How do I maintain my integrity and my patience when I'm coaching? How do I even coach? What's a framework I can use? It failed before. How could I turn it around? How do I hit the reset button with some of the relationships I have? How do I build accountability with my team? How do I turn around under performers? How do I sustain my top performers? Oh, and by the way, uh, a lot of these books are all theory based. Uh, is yours more tactically based? Because I read all these books on theory and then I close the book and I have no idea what I need to do next. So do you have a chronological path to follow to not only help me develop a world develop into a world-class leader and coach, but how can I actually transform our result-driven, metrics-driven culture into truly an authentic, healthy, high-performing coaching culture? And that's exactly what this book provides. 10 years, cool. 75 countries later, five continents. I can tell wow. you now, this is a universal language. 75 countries you've, yes. you've taught it Yes. I think it's interesting, actually, because I've read a lot of sales books, right, Keith, and I don't know how much of our previous shows you've written. I am, I, I'm a little pessimist, really, and I'm, and I'm prone to absolutely panning books. So I know, I can see it, but I'm going to say, you know, and I'm not just saying this because you're in the show, this is one of the favourite books that I've read. And as much as anything, I thought, I thought it's nicely written, actually. I thought the way in which it's laid out is written, tip from the coach, all that kind of thing. But the one thing... It, uh, that's made me interject to you here about the 75 countries is, is I can see it fitting across different salespeople of different kinds. So in the tech sector that, you know, that we recruit in, you recruit, we recruit for incredibly aggressive sales companies and actually some that are quite laid back as well. Mm -hmm. And I can see it sort of fitting across the different teams. Sorry, gents, I stole your thunder. Go on. No, not yeah. at all. I think it's so important because how many books are truly written from a global point of view. I'll be the first to say, when I wrote Coaching Salespeople into Sales Champions, it was from a very myopic US point of view. And was then it? I traveled the world and realized, oh my God, the US isn't the center of the universe? And well, it's, it surprised me how it wasn't very US-y. That's exactly, you, thank you. When you look at sales teams, right? So, so we've got you know clients who work for US sales teams or European sales teams or English sales teams or Indian sales teams. And actually, I've got to tell you, if I couldn't hear the accent, but I could just look at the actions, I could tell you where that salesperson came from. They just carry the country's DNA into the sales force. But when you read it, it was almost sort of a a AD in terms of it not necessarily having any accent, for want of a better word, in the yeah. book. I didn't think. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. So, should we hit some questions then, Japs? Yes, I'll start if okay. you want. Yeah, number, you go with number one, Mike. So I'll tell you the one that came to me, actually, Keith, it's interesting because I was with a client um, quite recently having done one of the shows. And I'll and I tell you what he'd said. And for purpose of this, he wanted to, he wanted to remain anonymous, actually, because I don't think he really wants to upset his sales force. But here's what he said. He said, I'm the sales director of a software business with eight salespeople, all of whom reporting to me. I can see most of the guys doing this, but I think I'll struggle to enroll my top performer and I don't want to upset him. I know there that I know that no one's bigger than the, the than the team, but this guy's bigger than the team. He said this guy's outperforming everybody else, and I just I just leave him to it. I don't want to upset his apple cart. So come on, Keith, what's that fella going to do? Should he just leave the one guy to do whatever he wants to do, or should he enrol the one guy amongst the other eight? Yeah, because <laughs> I've I've been there too, as a leader, where you have one guy that, you know, you end up with 
maybe one or two performers where in many respects you start to wonder who's in charge of the team. Uh, I, I wrote an article, this was probably several years back, uh, entitled, When to Fire Your Top Performer. Okay, right. go on. So, so, I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need to first, in the spirit of coaching, in even the landscape, when we're talking about top performers, what are the metrics behind that? What are the characteristics? Are we assuming that are we only looking at a number or are we also looking at who they are, uh, their attitude? Are they, a, are they a good corporate citizen or are they toxic? And are they causing, you know, a cancerous uh, atmosphere within the team? Because yeah. that really is what I wrote about is you can hit your number every month. But that to me, that doesn't mean you're always a top performer if you're creating so much collateral damage in its wake. Yeah. So you're saying in that case then, they should, he should enforce this on, it, on on that top performer. If the top performer doesn't like it, then he can bugger off, basically. Well, I, and it really goes back to enrollment. It, there's some really huge assumptions that managers have around who they can deliver value to. And a lot of it bl- really goes down to what is my role as a manager? How do I give value? And managers feel that their value is being the chief problem solver. Well, people are coming to me and they're looking for the answer. So what happens when my top performer comes to me and they were better than I ever was, you know, when I was in their position, I can't help them. And they're, they're making a gross assumption where the reality is, how do you provide value to a top performer? Just like how does an athletic coach provide value to the greatest athletes in the world? It's not Correct. that they're better. It's they're and observing. How, how often, Michael, do we hear candidates come to us and say, and you say to them, why are you looking for a new job now? And one of the reasons that comes out in the conversation is that the candidate says, I just don't feel like my manager's delivering any value to me anymore and I'm getting nothing out of that relationship. Yeah, you do hear that a lot. But just on that, on that subject, though, Keith, and this is one of the other questions that one of my other guys sent in, actually. He said, and a very down-to-earth man, Johnny knows him pretty well, he said, I don't feel that I'm skilled enough to properly uncover the needs um, and and, ro- and get people enrolled. Because I think that your book, and I'm going to sound critical now, I don't mean to, I, I apologize. No. If you do. Well, I don't apologize, bugger it. Don't apologize. But, 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 I, but I think to myself that one of the core fundamentals of the leads process, which I'm a big advocate of, is your ability to enroll somebody. So if they're not 100% enrolled, if they're part enrolled, it's going to fail. And I actually, I think you overestimate people's ability to get people enrolled. Say more about that. So, so you make some premise on the book um, about, you know, you report to me, I've got to get you enrolled into the process for the, me then to take you through the process. And if you're only half enrolled, then it ain't going to work. Mm-hmm. But you're either enrolled or you're not. Mm-hmm. But I think that a lot of the salespeople that are out there actually aren't skilled enough as listeners, because the coaching process is much about listening as it is about talking, aren't, enrolled enough of, aren't skilled enough as listeners to enroll people. So I think they'll try and enroll people, not get them enrolled, then waste the time doing it. Yeah. And may, may I add something to that as well? Please. Is that actually one of the things I noticed, Keith, is you've clearly been very well trained. So you use a lot of clean language and you're questioning and you're using a lot of very good open questioning technique. Um, Michael and I are both aware that a lot of the people that we engage with in our universe actually simply don't have that skill level to ask, for example, questions at, 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 with that level of t- the technical phrase I would use is cleanliness. Um, and similarly, they're not as adept at asking questions in that opener manner or, for example, using reflective listening. So fundamentally, there's an underpinning here, which is to coach or to enroll. You actually have to have pretty good listening and, and uh, uh, questioning technique without which you're pretty stuffed. Well, isn't it like in sales? You know, the irony is the two most important skills that every top salesperson truly needs to master is the ability to ask the right questions and the ability to proactively and intentionally listen. And ironically, it's the two least developed skills among salespeople and right. amongst leaders. So to your point, if I could build off why else I wrote the book, I find, and and Michael, this speaks to uh, to your point before, is when I'm coaching CEOs and VPs and, and frontline sales managers, quite often the conversation sounds like, hey, Keith, I have to have a tough conversation with this person. Their numbers are down. 
Uh, they've been an underperformer for the last three quarters. I tried to have this conversation before. I don't know what to do. Well, my first question to them is, what did the conversation sound like? Because to your point is leadership is a language and the language of leadership is coaching. So it's sort of like me going to Spain, not learning Spanish and expecting everyone to know how to speak English and say, what's wrong with everybody? You don't, I'm speaking English. You don't understand what I'm saying. The same scenario happens in every global organization. People are speaking different languages, and I'm not talking about native tongue. I'm talking about, are you the directive problem-solving manager who motivates from fear, or are you the empowering coaching manager who truly empowers people to develop on their own? So let's say they're the former then, Keith. Let's say, let, let, you know, how, how are you going to fix that then? Because if people haven't got the skill to enroll, what's the answer? In my, I always say there's one thing that needs to be present for any, any salesperson, any employee, or any manager to, to be coachable and to truly accelerate their success is they need to have a desire to change. As long as there is a desire to change and improve themselves, who they are, and their performance, they're coachable. And so, who creates the desire then? Do you create the desire or do they create the desire? And that's, my, my, back to your point is, if a manager comes to me and says, Keith, this person isn't bought into coaching, it comes down to one of two things. And my job is to make managers' job easier. I mean, their jobs are tough enough is, number one, they don't have a desire to change. And if you have people on your team that are not coachable, you have the wrong people on your team. Yeah. Uh, and, number, and, number, and number two is if, you're, if you do have the right people on your team and you do go to enroll them, and then you come back to your coach and say, hey, Keith, enrollment doesn't work. My response is enrollment works brilliantly. Your enrollment statement didn't work. Let's talk about it. How did you position it? What was the language you used? And now let's re-language it and up, up language it so it lands better on other people. Uh, and whilst we're on that subject, then let's talk about this because I mentioned this in the book. You know, I don't know whether we're gonna we're, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna fall out of it, this Keith. But I thought some of your enrollment language was a bit self-deprecating, really. Hey, yeah. listen, I've really let you down. I'm such a bad person. Yeah, I just, we didn't know. Know. <laughs> listen, man, I just I, I just walk out the. I just think, yeah, what? And and, and, our, and our concern was Keith, and you did allude to it before we kicked off on the show. Was our concern was we felt that that was a cultural mismatch. And that that might work in some of the language around enrollment might work, for example, in the US and being that self-deprecating and humble, whereas a lot of the guys, you know, Mike and I talked off air about this, about some of the personalities we know. And we asked ourselves, this guy, could you imagine him having that conversation with somebody? And we just, there's a lot of them we don't believe would have the humility to do that. Um, and, and actually... I wondered the extent to which I personally would have the humility, or Michael in particular. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I'll, I'll enroll you on after this. I'll, we'll, we'll have an enrollment. <laughs> I'll enroll I'm you in. on enrollment. But but, so, but but the point though is though, yeah. Keith, to get on it is is let's say you know you're one of my clients. You know, mm -hmm. typically they're alpha male, fairly sort of assertive souls. I just can't see them saying that. What happens out in the field? Does that happen at Amazon Web Services is one of your clients? Does that happen at Salesforce or PepsiCo? Or is that just a bit idealistic? It happens in every global organization I've worked with. And this is exactly the reason why in sales leadership, I specifically wrote stories and started with them where the story originated from. I will say this happened in Saudi. When I was in Italy, this happened. When I was in the UK, this happened. Hey, here's a really interesting story that happened when I was training a team of managers in Denmark and Norway or in India or in South America. There's not a person on this planet who could look at me and say, Keith, coaching doesn't work. It's but, but, but do you get so let, me, let me finish. Let me finish. I really want to, I want to answer your question, Michael. So yeah, yeah. for both of your points, what's very interesting is you started your um, – assessment by saying, hey, Keith, listen, this may work in the US, but you know, in the UK, it's a little airy-fairy. We're much more direct here. This is how I am. First of all, guys, as I will tell every manager, and I hear that almost in every delivery I, I have, wherever I am across the world, they say, Keith, that would never work on me and it would never work on my team. 
My next question is, have you tried it before? No. Yeah, okay. Good point. Oh, so you never tried it before. Hmm. And, and why do you feel it's not going to work on your team? Well, because it, it wouldn't work on me. Oh, interesting. So what assumptions are we making here? We're, first of all, if you've never tried it, you have no idea if it's going to work or not. And what really stops managers from coaching and enrolling is it's the quintessential. Well, I'm coaching in my own image. Hey, listen, if you did that on me, that would not work. Mike, I'm a very directive person. If you were my boss, you'd come to me and say, Keith, listen, your numbers are down. Here's what you need to do. This is what you need to do this week. Here's what I expect from you at the end of the week. Now go. I'm going to look at you and say, thanks, boss. I'm out. You know, if you, do that, that to, you, you do that to some people, you make them cry. I've, I've got to tell you, I did think that was, be- sorry to interrupt you whilst you're on that. I thought that was your, your part about chief problem solver and being directive, I just thought was 100% on the money. I thought yeah. that was absolutely just spot on. And Jonathan, I think he's going to quote you on this because one of his uh, clients was talking to you about it. But you said you can't scale dependency. Yeah, that's a, that, that's that been a massive takeaway for me, Keith. Mm, yeah. as, a, as a business leader myself and as somebody, you know, Michael and I, we've just come out of a meeting now where we're talking about 2019 business planning and scale. And the, you can't scale dependency, particularly as somebody that's run teams where, you know, Michael... Johnny is chief problem solver. I'll tell you what, when Johnny trained me 18 years ago, when I first started, <laughs> started I used to sit next to him with a notepad and pen and he used to write a script that I then used to have to say. Yeah. And you see that in your clients, Keith. People must say, listen, this is what you need to say to him or her. You must get that all the time. And it really goes back to this language of leadership. People are going to have, oh, this is how I deal with the conversation. Oh, this is a talk track. And while I know, guys, I'll be the first to say in every talk track, even in the email templates I included in my book, I purposely overwrote them. They are bloody long. They are (laughs) too long. And that's why I've, I've reinforced throughout my book, I'm appealing to a global audience, some of, pe- some of the managers are going to like the context of it. Some of them are going to look at this and say, you know what? I can cut this in half and still deliver the same message with my style. Which, was how I, which is how I read it. So, for example, some of the enrollment conversations, and I think when Mike and I talked about it on the show last week, I said to Mike, I think I could make that work, but it would have to come from my voice. And my voice would be a lot more honest, which would be something like, listen, guys, I've been on this course and... It was actually really interesting, and I, I learned a load, and I'd really like to try it. Um, I'd be, it'd be great if you guys would be up for it. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be perfect at it, but it, I'd really appreciate it if you give me a chance. Yeah. Where and, I, 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 and so I think the way you've written it is you've written it at the nth degree of what would sound perfect, mm-hmm. knowing that different people will probably translate it to their own needs. Yes. And I would rather, you know, it's sort of like going to the gym, right? You have all this different equipment. There's an unlimited amount of exercises. Everyone works out and exercises in a different way to achieve the result. But the equipment's there. How you choose to use it is up to you. There's right. still that baseline of getting into the gym and exercising, just like there's still that baseline of enrollment. How you communicate it is, I always say, follow the model. The, the model is universal. But yes, then you get to breathe your individuality and your voice into that. And that to me is where it makes it personal. And, you know, Mike, to your point about, hey, you know, to, to apologize, to say I did you a disservice. Let's put that in context now. If I was your managers and yes. we had a good relationship, I will probably not say, hey, guys, I failed you. I did a disservice. I'm going to say what what Jonathan said, which is, hey, you know, I just took this amazing course uh, based on this best-selling book, glo- globally renowned book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Put it up there again, Keith. Right. And hey, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to be perfect at this, but I know it's going to make me a better leader and make you more successful. You want to give it a shot. That's perfect languaging. Nice and short, you're done. But how about this? What about the person who had a toxic relationship with one of their direct reports? What about that person who feels, oh my gosh, I can enroll this person because we don't have that trusting relationship. 
First of all, they're walking in with an assumption. Second, this is exactly why I created the separate framework of enrollment. How do you reset relationships? So it's not only about setting expectations of a relationship or setting your intentions to, to know that other people know what's in it for them, but it's also about resetting relationships and resetting intention. So if I was that directive chief problem solver and I could sense the erosion of trust that was happening on my team, well, then I do owe them an apology. That is on me. And any manager that pushes back on that, I'm going to say to them, listen, who do you want to be managed by? Do you want to be managed by a manager who thinks they're the greatest coach in the world and has never coached before effectively nor learned how to coach? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather be coached by someone who's truly authentic and transparent and say, hey, we're both going on this journey together. I'm not going to get it perfect the first time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think you're yeah, I, I agree with you, Keith. Now you've told me that I don't have to be uh, quite so uh, self-deprecating. I mean, listen, I've got another question here. I've just got my notes here. So can I ask you this question, if I may? Please. So one of my clients, he said to me, I love this book. I have bought it and I'm going to start using it. My boss is not keen, <laughs> not in capital letters. <laughs> what should I do? Oh, chapter, you probably know my book better than me, guys. What is it? Chapter... Uh, Two or three creating a subculture. You're going to talk about crits, yeah. That's, you, that's the answer. You know, I, 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 um, it's been so many times where I, I would work in a global organization at the end of my uh, two days working with these managers so intensely. Uh, they're all excited to leave and coach. Mm. And inevitably they'll say to me, Keith, but you don't understand. My boss isn't coaching me, and we have a really result driven, metrics driven organization like every company out there. And I have a mm. target on my back and I could be the best coach in the world, but I'm not being evaluated by what a great coach I am. I'm being evaluated by my number. You know, how do I change a culture like that? Well, mm. from that perspective, it feels like you're, you're turning a battleship. It feels very overwhelming. So what do managers truly have control of? What can they do to impact their people today? They could shift their thinking. And as opposed to thinking about, wow, how am I going to change this massive global culture? Now it's, what impact can I make on my team to create the team culture that I want? And that's 100% in every manager's power because their direct reports are interacting with them every day, speaking with them every day, emailing with them every day, having meetings with them throughout the week. In essence, the manager is the culture. So yeah. when you go to their team, they have an opportunity to enroll them in creating collectively the type of culture the team wants to work in and thrive in. I think also just, we, we, Michael, I was going to make yeah, a point here. I yeah, think yeah. we've missed the fundamental point of that particular question, which is, I love the book, I've bought it, and I'm going to start using it. My boss, however, is not keen. If you're on the course, if I'm a delegate on a Keith Rosen training, but my boss isn't keen, how does that work? Because your boss probably paid for it anyway. I don't know, Johnny. There's plenty of people who will do it off their own back. The, yeah, it'd be, it'd be an interesting question to ask Keith, actually. Is what, what percentage of delegates are paying for their own self-development on your training versus the amount that are paying via their employers? So I don't do public workshops or seminars. So okay. all, all my engagements are companies bringing me in and working directly with their team internally. Uh, and then I have okay. other clients that are calling me and I'll do one-on-one -on -one coaching with them. Okay. Uh, and sometimes their companies pay for it and sometimes they pay out of pocket. But when I'm, when I'm going into an organization, it's the company that's paying for it. Right. So there's always an element of enrollment. There has to be. I've been through so many countries and I'm not going to make any names because I don't want to uh, I don't want to plant the seed of any cultural assumptions. But I've walked into rooms throughout Europe um, with the first morning. And as we're going around the room, you know, the managers are like this. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I hear there they're like, oh, what's this guy from the U.S. going to teach? Me? Uh, it's just another training course, isn't it? We uh, all enter into it with our eyes. This with is our another mind. flavor of the month. You know, this will go away in a few days. I got to get back to the office and, and, you know, start to sell some stuff, cranking and pushing my salespeople to sell. So here they are. And I'll go around the room and I'll ask, so what are your expectations of the call? What are you hoping to get out of it? <laughs> and managers would look at me and say, I'm just looking to get credit, Keith. I really don't want to be there. I was <laughs> they actually really say that. I hope they do. Oh, straight up, straight up. And I say, you know what? I appreciate your honesty. And let's see what we can do to make this really worth worth your time. And if not, I would say bow out half a day. 
I would check in with that person day one over lunch. So what do you think? They said, I'm <laughs> saying, this is great. I didn't expect any of this. Cool. And that's the point. They don't realize it. I mean, listen, guys, assumptions just breeds all the challenges that managers and organizations struggle with every day. You know, pipeline inaccuracy, forecast inaccuracy, communication breakdowns, loss of trust. It all goes back to language. So okay. you change the language, you change the outcome. You change the conversation, you change the outcome. Okay, I've got one for you, Keith. This is one of my own personal questions that I've been thinking about uh, having allowed the book to, to seep in a little bit, which is, let's say I manage. So if you look at the market that Michael and I operate in, typically our target client is five to maybe 120 million turnover, 15 direct reports. A lot of our clients have got a big number of direct reports. So I'm a manager. I've got 15 direct reports. I'm coming out of coaching sessions and out of each coaching session, I've got a lot of coaching commitments. Yeah. Is Times, that the manager or the, is that the coach or the coachee? The, well, the, 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 the coach is creating accountability for a big volume of coaching commitments, isn't he? You know, if you do a good coaching call, how many commitments are we going to get out of each good coaching call? Well, when you say you say commitments, are you talking about commitments from the coach saying, hey, this from, is the, what, the no, coach commitment from the coachee? Well. So if I've done a good coaching call, my coachee is going to say to me, okay, so at the end of that call, hopefully the coach is going to say, right, I've got three or four actions to take here boss, and I'm going to go out and do it. But then there's an accountability point where I've actually got to then manage that and hold individual X accountable. Now, I know you've got your coaching form. For me, I felt that that could get very quickly out of control. Um, so what I, what I was really getting at was I, I felt that, how do you from there, what's the next, what's the bit, what one of the things that was missing in the book was, how do I then get back to, okay, you, we met a month ago and you said X and you were going to do X, but I got to do that times 15. And I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on your methodology for that next step, the bit where actually I got to hold some people to account for the fact that I gave them an hour of my coaching time and that they made some commitments and then I've got to bring them back and say, okay, where are we at with just those commitments? Not the stuff in the pipeline, but all that. Mm, okay. So if I, if I have a senior moment, guys, just remind me to uh, expand on the prep form and holding people accountable. Because I think, John, that's what you're saying is, okay, yeah. so going through this great coaching session, at the end, there are some action steps and go-dos, but how do I hold them accountable to actually achieving those results? Yes. The... Three questions that managers fail to ask, and it's amazing, I've done some videos on this, is it's actually really easy to hold people accountable. And interestingly, it's one of the things that managers struggle with the most. Why? Because in their head, they're thinking, how do I hold this person accountable? I know how I want to be held accountable, but they, it may not work for them. Wait, I don't want to micromanage them, but I can't wait a month, which was way too long to follow up, by the way. Uh, Coaching every week or every other week, a month, way too long. We could talk more about that. But what do I do to hold them accountable? When managers are asking themselves that question, they're asking the wrong person. Ask your people. Ask them. In, in the most simplistic terms, you're having the coaching session. The coach, he says, great. This is what I'm willing to commit to doing by next week and having done. Fantastic. Uh, so as your manager, how can I be the best accountability partner to support you and ensure you honor the commitments you make? That's a good question, that, Keith. Like How many that. managers do you know ask that? Uh, you don't. I, I've never met one. Never. Now, I'm not here's the second one managers don't ask, the follow-up. Well, Keith, what happens if they don't honor their commitments? Or yeah. what happens if they drop the ball? What do I do then? Well, here's the other question you follow up with. Hey, uh, if you don't honor the commitments you make, how do you want me to follow up with you? What's the best way to bring this up? So what you're doing up front is you're not holding them accountable after the fact. You're building the rules. You're creating the rules of engagement before. You're so there's alignment of this is how I want to be held accountable, boss. Great. You're well, you're never the bad guy. It's the therapeutic contract, isn't it? <laughs> and who, and who, who made the contract? The coach. They, yeah. Great. Like that, okay. Keith. Okay. Mike, on, on the prep form, guys, uh, 
And, you know, it's funny, I, I changed my position from my first coaching book to my second one, where I used to say to my clients, listen, for one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, as long as you show up prepared, I'm fine. If you don't show up prepared for a coaching session, whether you have it in your head or you use the coaching prep form, I'm going to cancel the call because that's a level of accountability the coach she has to have to ensure they get the value in every coaching session. And if managers don't do the same thing, well, then they're, they're, they're setting themselves up for failure because then the coach leaves saying, coaching doesn't work. I didn't get any value. Well, yeah. not only do I now enforce that every client does the coaching prep form, the reason I do that is it becomes a gauge and, and a path of progress for them. So if I start working with a client in January and every other week they're filling out that prep form and in January they hit me with Keith, these are all my challenges, these are all my goals. And then in December it's Keith, I reached all my goals and wow, those challenges, I, looking at my prep form from January, I can't believe I was dealing with that stuff. Now it becomes a gauge to say, wow, look how much I've grown. Look how much I've developed. So it really helps um, really articulate and help capture this is the impact of coaching, which is always the question that companies ask. What's the measurable impact of coaching? Great. Okay. What a great answer that I liked it. You know, and, and I, I must say, I feel like with some of these questions, I feel like I'm picking fault. I don't mean to at all. Um, oh, but we've got, there was a question that one of our clients set in. It was number six, Mike. Was that the one? Yeah, right. Are you ready for this? So I really love the book and have been very inspired. In the book, Keith stresses that a leader should always be coaching, ABC, and, that, and that's imperative that a coach avoids the typical behavior of many leaders to make assumptions, preconceptions, and to steer the conversation down a path to reach a conclusion that the coach believes to be the right one. To achieve this, Keith states that questions should not be pre-compiled, -comp leading, closed, and should be fluid from the heart and not the head. My question is therefore, is the overriding objective of coaching in this scenario always to get the coachee to reach their own conclusions as to what they need to do differently stroke better? And what if, the, and what if this is at odds with what, a, with what I, as a manager of that person, believe to be the core problem? Mm. Are my viewpoints, therefore, always wrong or unhelpful? Mm. I love that question. It's a very well thought out question. A very long nice question, Rick. That's a meaty question. So let's let's really make sure we dive into that. There's a lot of components there. It's it's enrollment. It's uh, do I kill them with questions? Uh, do I coach or do I close them? Coined a new name, cloaching. Cloaching. Uh, it's, it's cloaching. cloaching. We like it. It's wait. I'm coaching them. No, you're not. You're well, closing them. Well, I think his over his overall point is, isn't it? He's saying, you know, let's just ask questions and not and, and not take any uh, of our opinion into it. But what if the outcome isn't one that I agree with? Well, it's what, what I find is a lot of people, and forget managers, every person in the world, we suffer from absolute thinking. It's either white right or it's black. It's either right or it's wrong. And you can't have both. Coaching is all about creating new possibilities. And it's about not only creating possibilities in behavior and strategy, but most important in our thinking. And if you notice, really every, every question, the answer is not just about a go do, it's a go be. If you really wanna be a better coach and stop being a directive manager, you need to be someone who is insatiably curious because what is that, what is that breed and behavior? I'm going to ask more questions. If I come from a place of, I already know, then all I'm going to do is assess the facts rather than assume them. So to this gentleman's question, uh, in the framework, I provide 12 non-negotiable questions that you can ask in virtually every conversation. And if you use these 12 conversations, you can literally coach in 10 minutes or less. So I like that, that actually. I did, I did that now, okay, so what about all the other questions, Keith? I mean, are those the only coaching questions you ask? No. It just gives you a foundation to build from. And then you need to start listening to what that person is saying and use springboard questions to build off what you just heard. That framework guides the coach throughout the process. The either or thinking, which gets in the way is, wait, Keith. So what you're saying is I'm supposed to lead with questions and not answers. Okay. Okay. I got that. Um, 
So now I'm coaching someone and I'm using your framework and I'm asking these questions. And at the end of the conversation, they still have no idea what to do because they've never actually done that uh, Mm. skill or they never actually made a cold call or they never actually wrote a proposal before. And they say, boss, I don't know what to do. I've never done this before. Well, in the manager's mind, they're thinking, well, Keith told me I have to keep asking questions. Well, Mr. or Mrs. Salesperson, if you did know how to write a proposal, make a cold call, collaborate with the C-suite, what would it look like? Uh, I've never done it before. Well, if you did, what would it look like? It's only going to be a matter of time till that person's going to want to reach over and strangle (laughs) their manager. Yeah, yeah. Because like, boss, I've never done that. My point is this, that person has no baseline. If you want to be a professional athlete, you need to be trained and you're coached the same way, core competencies. Well, with coaching, there are times when the coach will, the coach will do a wonderful job coaching. The person's self-aware, they get the answer, they go with it. And of course, many times, which is the whole point of coaching is to uncover what people can't see on their own because people can't change what they don't see. So the manager's sitting there trying to coach in a situation, which is really a training issue. And they get to the point where, Keith, the coaching didn't work. And the reason why is they're thinking, oh, you mean I can provide my answer? You mean I can provide my opinion? It's the order in which you do it. And that's when managers breathe a sigh of relief. When someone comes to you with a challenge and they say, boss, I'm working on this deal. I'm having a hard time moving it over the finish line. What can you do? And the manager jumps in and says, who do I need to call? I'll help you. I'll fix it for you. Well, that's just being the directive chief problem solver. Yeah. When, the, when the manager now is listening to the situation, seeking to understand, asking those critical coaching questions, now they know what the coach knows, the coach he knows, and what the coach he missed. Now they can say, hey, you know, in this conversation, I'm hearing a few things that if we can work on together, would make you even more successful? Would you be open to hearing some of my observations? So what you're saying, Keith, is that actually, in answer to that question, at some point, often what the leader is seeing as a dumb answer is actually a skill gap. And actually, perhaps sharing that with the sales guy and saying, look, maybe there's a skill gap here. Maybe you need a little bit of support in developing that skill. And maybe we need to get you some training in that that's okay. But where it's not okay is diving in when actually the poor guy might have actually come to a conclusion himself that would have developed him much more greatly during the course of the coaching conversation. Have I understood that right? Absolutely. And, and I, the, the deeper collateral damage is managers don't realize not only are they disempowering their people and robbing them of the experience of that feeling of what it's like to get to the other side of a challenge on their own, but now the coachee is thinking, oh, I guess my boss doesn't trust me. I guess they don't think I'm competent. Maybe they're, I mean, maybe I'm on that, you know, path towards getting put on a performance improvement plan. And managers think it's just another day in the office. They don't yeah. realize, even in their good intentions, giving the answer creates the exact opposite environment they're looking to achieve. Okay. Here's one then. Something that was on mine, uh, Michael's mind, um, and that he and I have debated again off camera really, was you've talked about role-playing deals a little bit. Um, there was a couple of parts in the book where you talked about perhaps role-playing a conversation or role-playing a deal. Mike mm-hmm. and I were a bit resistant to that, weren't we, Mike? In as much oh. as... Well, we, you probably we, figured out, Keith, I'm a grumpy bugger. <laughs> <laughs> say that again, Mike? You probably it, figured out I'm, I'm a grumpy person, so I'm oh, quite resistant. No. Part of gold, just part of most. gold. You didn't fool Yeah, we were from the north of England, Keith. You know, we're grumpy guys. So... Um, the, the question I wrote was how many, often a lot of the guys we deal with are really senior level, 100K base salary, sterling, you know, um, which currently on the exchange rate, that's probably about 101K base salary dollars. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but um, how many guys like that are really going to be comfortable with role playing a deal in a coaching scenario? So we felt that almost there's an elasticity point of seniority where I think the coaching conversation and the dynamic around it really changes both at an enrollment level and at a general conversational level for for me. And we we were both unsure and we were both uncomfortable 
as to a how many really senior level heavyweight sales guys are going to want to role play a deal and how many of the leaders of those senior level guys are going to want to role play a deal with them or or coach to that extent because there's an expectation of listen buddy i give you 100k basic salary a year just bring me results why do i need to coach you well it's it's almost the same gross assumption of when i heard a manager say and i and it you know a few things shocked me this one did keith why should i acknowledge my people for just doing their job keith you're <laughs> right <laughs> Listen, right, I've got uh, it's a slight tangential thing, this, but I've got a pal of mine, right, who became a very, very senior economist, really senior economist in the UK, and he earned an awful lot of money, very, a very young age, actually. And he said to me, he said, listen, Mike, I am on commission. And his name was James. I said, you're not on commission, James. He said, yeah, I am. He said, if you don't produce, you'll get fired. He said, if I don't produce, I'll get fired. And his point was, as a, and he was a labor economist, you know, he, he did build economic models around the movement of labor across countries. He said, people get paid to do something. They should just get paid to do it and left to do it. And that's your point, isn't it? If I'm paying you 200 grand, I'm not going to coach you. Just bring me the results. You're, you're already trying to jump across the camera here, aren't you, Keith? Well, listen, guys. <laughs> If, if, if it was that easy, I'd be out of a job, right? I would stop <laughs> writing books. They, you know, don't coach anymore. It doesn't work. Well, if that was the case, then why, is, uh, why are 72% employees disengaged in the workforce? Why are less than 50% of salespeople going to miss their quota in 2018 and looking worse in 2019? So we can tell our people all day, hey, this is what you hired. This is what we expect. Now go do it. Well, how's that working, guys? Go to any company. Oh, well, Keith, um, actually, it's not really working very well. Oh, but we're hitting our number, Keith. And my question to that one is, okay, you're hitting your number every month. Is everyone on your team hitting their number? Oh, no, that never happens. Well, therefore, what would be possible if everyone did? If you move the needle 1% or 2% from coaching, isn't it worth it? Managers feel they don't want to coach because either the results are already there and, oh, well, we're getting the results, so why should I coach? Good results does not mean a good culture. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. You, know, you, you, know, you, you have your top people that are performing. Uh, that's an opportunity. You can't give value to them unless you know what the gaps are. And the only way you know what the gaps are with a top performer is you need to observe them. So I want to go back, Jonathan, to your point about – the word role play, uh, I don't even know if I use that word in my book. I use the word real play uh, because when I coach uh, managers and salespeople, I use real play and I use not role play. I use the word practice. Okay. Because if I'm working with um, a top salesperson and they come to me looking for help and they say, listen, we got this big deal online. We have to move it over to the finish lines to make sure this counts for this quarter. Uh, just want to let you know what I'm doing. Hey, I know how important this is to you. I'll tell you what, let's just do a quick practice run because you're going to call the CFO later today. And I just want to make sure that you have the right message to deliver to the CFO because we only have one shot at that. And it's a lot easier to practice on me and a lot safer than practice on the CFO. So how about we just run through it really quickly and see if there's a way to tighten the message up to ensure you achieve the results you want. Okay. Okay. Why not? Not, hey, let's role play right now. <laughs> so you've got to deliver it right. You've got to deliver it right. And isn't it going back again? Notice all roads, guys, go back to enrollment. If you uh, want, you know, I was going to say exactly that, actually. That's, that's the, that, that was a key for me, a key takeaway from the book was it's it, once you've got the enrollment thing in, I think, and then you follow the framework, everything else takes place. Oh, I love the fact there was a framework, actually. I just thought the frame, I, I'm a man who likes good framework. And I was going to ask you about that, actually, because I was, this isn't a formal question, but I was just talking to somebody about this when I was out meeting a client. And, I, and he said, how are you getting on with the book? And I said, yeah, I like the book. And he said, what do you like about it? I said, it's nicely written for a start. And something that, that it felt that you'd given us, Keith, is I think that you gave us most of the juice of the action. And by that, what I mean is a lot of the sales books that you read, they're like a long brochure to buy a sales coaching course. Whereas actually, yeah. you've, I felt like you gave us most of the coaching action. So if, let's say, we then sat down and did some coaching with you, is your coaching just 
and inverted commas just, but just um, um, more of the same, or is there more that you add to it? And by the way, I think if it were more of the same, that was one of the things I liked about the book, that you gave us a good insight into everything that was in your your sales leadership. I, I, market, I agree, Michael. Just a little snapshot. I actually know if I was to do a coaching session tomorrow, I could dip into the book, open it, and think, right, okay, I'm going to use that, 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 and I'm going to try and use it today. But my client's Whereas, sort of point was, John, and, and that's exactly, Jonathan, what I want every reader to feel, that they yeah. have that confidence in the book that it becomes literally their their new leadership Bible and tactical, and that's why it's a tactical playbook. Yeah. Michael, I know you had a question on that. Well, no, the sort of the question was a conversation point, really, which was, let's say I signed up for, for some of your coaching. Is the coaching an extension of the book or is there more in the coaching that isn't in the book? Gotcha. I, I basically wrote myself out of business when I write my books. Right, cool. I, I like that, though. I, I, I am, I'll be the first to say, guys, I'm the worst self-promoter in the world. Um, it, it rubs me so badly. I, it's so against my integrity to, to write a book and – Make it a pitch. What's the point of writing a book? The point of writing a book is to make an impact in the world. You know, and the byproduct is if people like what they read, they're going to say, Keith, this is everything we want. Now we need to bring it alive. We need to bring you into the company. We need you to make this fit into our culture, um, complement our sales process, you know, reinforce how this uh, can work with managers and how they can use our CRM to uncover coaching moments. It goes a lot of it goes deeper and wider. And you guys know very well, you could read the book, but it's like any athlete. If you're not practicing, you're not getting yeah. better. Absolutely. Think, uh, on a slightly separate point, Keith, are you a salesman or are you a coach by trade? <sighs> uh, both. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, the first, cause what's interesting He's about you? Because I've, I, a scope, cause I've, met, <laughs> I've met a lot of sales guys, right? And you feel very much like a salesman and do take that as a compliment because it's meant as one. Yeah, but you actually genuinely care about being a coach, I think, as well. To me, coaching is caring. To me, selling is caring. Uh, the definition of selling is creating a new possibility. The definition of coaching is creating a new possibility. To me, the evolution of selling is coaching. So I don't sell. I just coach. So to me, there is no difference which is why the book is entitled Sales Leadership. It, it's not entitled Sales Management. And ironically, it is the first book ever written, shockingly, entitled Sales Leadership. Wow. That, amazed me. That, that amazed me, actually. There's a load of sales books out there, but I actually can't, I mean, I've got a few on my shelf, but I can't think of another that was so sales leadership focused, actually, with a model like this. The, other, the, the others feel, feel like cottage industries by comparison to this book, I thought. That was one of the things I really liked about it. Thank you. And, and that's why I also, which was a bit of a challenge, I have to say, is writing it in a way where I'm giving enough examples for managers and media examples, go do's that they could take with their people and their and handle challenges or help people achieve a goal and move that goal over a finish line. Uh, and at the same time, it, with, the, with the book, making sure they have the framework, the language, the approach that's going to allow them to follow, like your point, Michael, you said you like structure. I think uh, most people do like structure. I think most people yes, in nature like structure. They do. Keith, may I ask you, w would you recommend sharing the model with a coachee or sharing the book with a coachee? A, a thousand percent. Uh, it, to me, that's that speaks to volumes of the leader to truly be a vulnerability-based leader. So uh, where I said before, coaching and selling to me are the same, you know, it's about delivering value and seeking to understand and um, honoring people's individuality. Uh, when you're, you know, to your, to your question, Jonathan, I'm sorry, can you ask me that question one more time? I just want to make sure yeah. I capture it. So for, for me, sometimes I've often, as I've read through the book, I've thought if I was to do a coaching session tomorrow, I think I would print out or I'd scan certain parts of the model. And I would give them to the coachee before we start. So this is what I want to work through. I'm going to ask you these questions. I might ask them in a slightly different way, but this is where I'm coming from. And actually try and use that as part of my enrollment strategy. Well, let's, let's play this one out, Jonathan. Okay, so I'm, I'm your coach right now, right? So yeah. in my hand, I got my book and you're in front of me and I'm like this. Okay, next question. <laughs> next question. <laughs> okay here's what you need to do people are gonna be like what are you what are you doing <laughs> this idiot. Are you doing this so again 
I hate to sound redundant, but all roads go back to enrollment. Um, yeah. I think you're spot on with that. And, and managers, they say, what? Take out the book, share with them, show them what I'm doing. Yeah, because that shows that you're vulnerable, not vulnerable as in putting yourself in harm's way, but you're being authentic, you're being human, you're being transparent. And that stimulates the law of reciprocity. When I can go to one of my direct reports and say, hey, listen, I, I got this framework here. I want to share it with you so you know what I'm doing. This is, this is what I'm going to be trying. And I'm learning this you know, every day. And, and I want to know from you if I'm, I'm getting better at this every day. Uh, but here's, here's the model. Check it out. Uh, here's also the framework that I'm using for enrollment so you know what that's about. And if you have any questions, let's talk about it because I want you to learn how to coach so you can coach me just so I can learn how to be a better coach to coach you. Yeah, and you're creating an elite improvement culture then, aren't you? The, 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 you're creating an improvement culture that says this team is about being better and better every day. And, 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 and no way, God, I, I, I've day. had managers say, well, Keith, what about taking notes? Now, easier if you're, I coach virtually on the phone, but if you're face-to-face with one of your direct reports um, or someone you're coaching and you're sitting there you know, taking notes in front of them and you don't tell them what you're doing, especially manager to direct report, you're going to freak them out because they're thinking, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, this is so going into your HR permanent file right now. <laughs> you have no idea what I'm writing, but oh, you have no, I'm capturing this all. They're not going to want to be coached. Why? Because they don't understand your intention. And when people don't understand your intention, the human condition defaults to fear. So to your point about sharing, hey, here's the framework, I always say, hey, here are the notes I'm taking. I just want to let you know the notes I'm taking are just so I don't step over any opportunities where I can work together with you to deliver more value. And if you want to yeah. see the notes I'm taking, I'm happy to, happy to share them with you. Okay, now I know my manager's intention and I know it's for the benefit of me. Cool. Right. I think we should wrap up here, fellas. Keith. We have really enjoyed this one. And, it, you know, doing Book Club has been a journey for us in many respects. One, actually, it's been a great discipline because it's forced us into at least once a month reading a new sales book. Um, and if that's the only thing we ever got out of it, it would be an amazing journey. Um, but what we have got is we've learned a lot. We've, and with each book, I've taken something, I would say, out of yours thus far, without being sycophantic, I've taken more out of this one, maybe because it speaks to me at a specific point in my own career, as we move towards scaling the team here at IRC, I, I know that I've got a lot of takeaways from it. Overall, it's been great. If you're listening to the show today, I couldn't recommend enough. If you are a sales leader, read this book. It is good. And I think as Michael pointed out, it's actually full of stuff you can open up and use tomorrow. It's not just the sales pitch to buy some sales training from a sales training organization. This is actually a, a useful manual. And as Keith said, he, he's, he's left nothing out there. So Keith, I'd like to thank you so much for being a good sport. I know, you know, Mike and I, have, we, we don't hold back when we're reading the book. We, we discuss it with real honesty. Um, and then you've come on the show and talked to us about it. And actually, you've helped us give it a little bit of extra thought. So thank you ever so much for coming on today. Um, thanks. In reality, it's been great. And uh, we look forward to seeing the next book. What's the next one going to be about? Oh, great recruitment be... companies in the UK. <laughs> What's that? Say <laughs> so great recruitment companies in the UK. Yes. They, that's Thank you. Perfect segue on that one. We can wrap up. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Great. Nice to see you today, Kate. See you later. Thank you, Keith. Take care. Bye.